Next, um, I'd like to welcome Patrick Feaster back up. And Patrick is going to um, tell us uh, some details about his interpretation of Edison's path to the phonograph. How did he come up with the idea? How did he arrive at the invention? And after Patrick uh, explains his interpretation, we'd like to open up the room for a discussion to see if you have any questions or opinions. Uh, we're just curious about uh, how, what you're all thinking. And David will act as a moderator with the handheld microphone. So if you have any questions um, or you'd like to speak, just raise your hand and David will bring the microphone to you. So the assignment I was given was to lay out to the best of my ability, what, what's the evidence we can bring to bear on the question of whether Thomas Edison knew about the phonograph when he came up with his phonograph. Uh, so that's what I'll do. And I'd like to start with uh, one particular source anecdote. This is from Edison's Open Door by Edison's one-time secretary and uh, collaborator, uh, Alfred Ord Tate. <clears throat> I shall relate it in Edison's own words as he related it to me one day in his room at the Bergman factory in the autumn of 1885. There was a fellow named Scott, he said. I'm not going to do the Edison voice there. <clears throat> Leon Scott, a Frenchman, who in 1837, 10 years before I was born, made the first mechanical record of sound, the first sound writing. He made a diaphragm of thin stretched sheepskin and used a pig's bristle for a stylus. Then he coated a paper tape, like the stock ticker tape, with lamp black, that's a hydrocarbon, and made it travel in contact with the stylus. That's the way the first sound writing was made. What became of the invention, I asked. I don't know, he replied. Scott sent the record to the Royal Society in England, and I suppose it's in some museum, but it never got any further. I never heard about Scott, he continued, until years after I invented the phonograph. This account was published in 1938, 53 years after Tate claims Edison had related it to him, but Tate assures us he has the wording right. In quoting Edison in these pages, I'm reporting his words as accurately as though they were uttered yesterday, he insists. I am not improvising or inventing anything. In fact, some details in this account are plainly incorrect, but I believe the mistakes actually help confirm its overall accuracy. For example, Tate quotes Edison as saying the phonograph had been invented in 1837, 10 years before I was born. Since Edison was born in 1847, and the date of the invention of the phonograph is usually given as 1857, it's likely Edison had actually said in 1857, 10 years after I was born, and that Tate had misremembered the direction of the date as reckoned from the year of Edison's birth. And if we accept Tate's account as a more or less authentic record of Edison's words, we learn some noteworthy things from it. First, Edison privately acknowledged that Scott had, quote, made the first mechanical record of sound, the first sound writing. In his public statements, he was never quite this explicit about acknowledging Scott's breakthrough. Second, Edison suspected that records of sound made before his invention probably survived in some museum. So he wouldn't have been shocked by the discovery of Scott's phonogram of Eau Claire de la Lune, as recorded on April 9th, 1860. Third, and this is the point on which I want to focus here, Edison claimed to have learned about, Scott's, about Scott himself and presumably his work only after he had invented his own phonograph. Years after I invented the phonograph is clearly an exaggeration, but uh, dates seem to have been a weak point in Tate's memory, so maybe Edison's actual words were something like, I never heard about Scott until months after I invented the phonograph. After all, when Edison visited Washington in April 1878, he's reported to have seen a phonograph at the Smithsonian. The New York Herald had this to say. At the Smithsonian Institution the other day, Edison saw a phonograph, a machine used for delineating graphically the form of the sound waves and examining it. Curiously, a moment he remarked to a friend, wise men these were, not to see that they could put a hard point in a piece of tinfoil in front of it, and there was the phonograph. A couple months later, the Evening Journal reported, Mr. Edison, and speaking of Mr. Scott, the inventor of the phonograph, said, 
Why the deuce didn't he think of substituting a sheet of tinfoil for his carbon film? In other words, Edison's supposed to have expressed astonishment that anyone who'd known about the phonograph hadn't also thought of adapting it to play back the sounds it recorded. That's not the reaction we should have expected from him if he had previously known about the phonograph, but hadn't made such a connection himself. Taken together, these anecdotes seem to imply that Edison first learned about Scott and the phonograph during his visit to Washington in April of 1878. He unquestionably knew about the phonograph by the summer of 1878 when the Metropolitan Elevated Railroad responded to public noise complaints by hiring him to study train sounds. And he modified one of his own phonographs into a phonograph to carry out this work by studying visual records. The New York Sun of July 14th, 1878, then quoted him as explaining, this instrument is the phonautograph of Leon Scott, an invention that is familiar to the shelves of every scientific school and college in the country. At the same time, he claimed that Scott's original phonautograph hadn't been very sensitive. The uh, phonautograph, he said, is not at all the peer of the phonograph. For instance, if you shout the word how, in the phonograph, it records perhaps 80 vibrations, whereas the phonograph records seven or 800. In the Scott phonograph, as is proved in every scientific school, the vibrations produced by certain guttural sounds are marked down upon a cylinder. It has no compass and will not register sounds of a high pitch. Edison expressed similar sentiments in the margin of his copy of the 1875 edition of Helmholtz's On the Sensations of Tone as a physiological basis for the theory of music, uh, written in pencil and later erased, but still legible. Uh, you can actually see the original right back there in a case. Um, well, mostly legible. I transcribed it here as untrue record. This instrument never gives true records. Um, over there, the transcription is true recordings. That part's really hard to read because it's right over the text, but something like that. The message itself is clear. Of course, this marginalia could have been written at any time, before or after 1877, but it's consistent with public statements Edison made about the phonograph during the summer of 1878, right after his invention. On the other hand, many writers have insisted that Edison must already have known about the phonograph in 1877 at the time he devised his own phonograph and that it simply isn't plausible to claim otherwise. R.D. Darrell writes, there is an irritating tendency of the Edison biographers to ignore the fact that Edison must have been familiar with the work of Scott, whose theories were fairly common knowledge at the time, particularly among telephonic re experimenters, or to imply that he first became acquainted with the phonautograph after the 1877 invention. Darrell's not alone in this view. Uh, the Count de Moncel wrote in 1878 that, quote, Mr. Edison was well acquainted with Mr. Scott's phonautograph. The Daily Herald of Delphos, Ohio stated in 1898 that, quote, the phonautograph by Leon Scott was a sound recorder and gave Edison the idea of the phonograph. Thomas Hankins and Robert Silverman write in their excellent 1995 book, Instruments in the Imagination, that, quote, the American inventor was undoubtedly familiar with the older device. These statements hinge on three points, that the phonograph was pretty well known, that Edison would have had ample opportunity to learn about it, and that the resemblance of his phonograph to it seems too great to be mere coincidence. Of course, we all know the instrument entitled the phonautograph, Alexander Graham Bell said during one of his lectures about the telephone in 1877, taking for granted that everyone in his audience knew what that was. And Edison wouldn't have needed to travel all the way to MIT in Boston or the Smithsonian in Washington to see one. The Stevens Institute in nearby Hoboken had acquired a phonograph in 1871. Critics who believe Edison must have known about the phonograph sometimes also argue that he might have lied about this in an effort to make his own work seem more impressive. I'd suggest to the contrary that ignorance of the phonograph would be nothing to boast about. It's more the stuff of a mildly embarrassing confession. But this line of argument could still lead some people to dismiss Edison's own statements as intentional deceptions. It's sometimes also suggested that Edison must have found out about Charles Crow's description of a method for reproducing recorded sounds dated April 16th, 1877, and deposited in a sealed envelope with the Academy of Sciences on April 30th. 
In fact, this was a confidential and well-guarded document. There's really no way Edison could have gained access to it. However, an article about Crowe's idea did appear in print in France on October 10th, 1877, and even used the word phonograph. So it sometimes claimed Edison must have got the idea for his own phonograph from that, uh, even though, as we'll see, Edison was already well along his path to the phonograph by October 10th. The big question we're left with, then, is this. Did Edison know about Scott's phonograph when he invented his phonograph? Did it give him the inspiration for it? Is there any way we can even know for sure, one way or the other? I think there is. Edison's path to the phonograph is pretty well documented in dated laboratory notes and other sources. If he'd known about the phonograph, we ought to see signs of that, both in his theoretical understanding of sound and in specific technical approaches he considered. In particular, we'd expect to see some evidence that he knew sound could be recorded laterally as a wavy line traced across a surface, and that the shape of the line, the waveform, was crucially important for conveying differences among speech sounds. But we don't find anything like that. Instead, Edison reached the phonograph, I believe, by a way of an entirely different path, a path along which it's hard to find any one step where we could say, ah, that's where knowledge of Scott's phonograph was the decisive factor. Edison brought a formidable understanding of electricity and chemistry with him to his work on the telephone in the 1870s, but the field of acoustics was relatively new to him. One of his very first telephone sketches, drawn about July of 1875, shows a couple different ways to convey speech vibrations to one prong of a tuning fork, an arrangement that doesn't seem to make much sense. The editors of his papers remark that he, quote, seems not to have understood at this point that a giving tuning fork responds strongly only to a particular frequency. And it would be pretty hard to find a more basic piece of practical acoustic knowledge than that. But I'd like to suggest a different interpretation. According to a later court deposition, Edison had first tried to read up on acoustics in late 1874 or early 1875 by reading a book called The Wonders of Electricity, which contained an optimistic passage about the possibility of an electric speaking telephone. There were those out there, just the experts who were skeptical. And then took the matter up in earnest in July 1875 at the request of Western Union President William Orton, who gave him an article about Philip Rice's telephone, which I talked about a little bit earlier. As I mentioned then, Philip Rice thought speech vibrations consisted of simple pulses that varied only in how intense they were. Maybe every other pulse was extra strong, or maybe every third pulse. Edison now seems to have picked up the same peculiar idea, either from reading something Rice had written, or just from analyzing Rice's telephone and the logic behind it. He decided what was needed to fix Rice's telephone was to find some way of transmitting the actual variations in the intensity of each one of these pulses. And that's what he set out to do as he later explained in a legal deposition, although his language is a little confusing. Instead of strong pulses versus weak pulses, he talks about loud or strong sounds versus low sounds. But one piece of evidence along these lines that's pretty clear dates from March 23rd, 1877, when he was preparing to apply for his first telephone patent. During a meeting with his attorney, Lemuel Serrell, he wrote at the top of a sheet of paper that, quote, speaking consists of sound at one rate of vibration, meaning one frequency. According to Serrell, Edison said he had discovered, quote, that articulate speech was altogether different to music, that musical sounds had, as was well known, a regular rate of vibration, that speech had both a rate of vibration and a volume. A person could speak in one musical key or another, and that the volume of the respective utterances determined the articulated sounds. Now, suddenly, Edison's earlier plan to convey speech vibrations to a tuning fork starts to make a bit more sense. If speech really did consist of vibrations at a single frequency, there'd be a reason to do that. And here you see Edison's effort to illustrate what he means. From his background in telegraphy, he was used to seeing electrical signals recorded as rows of dots and dashes by the striking of vertically mounted telegraph sounders against strips of paper and he'd understandably turned to this familiar format for drawing a telephone signal. According to Serrell's later recollection, Edison had, quote, illustrated his ideas and explanations by two rows of dots 
the upper row of dots indicating musical tone vibrations, the lower row of dots, the greater or less volume of the sounds in articulations, the rate of vibration being the same, single frequency. Edison himself accounted for the sketch in similar terms, speaking of, quote, the upper row of dots representing waves of invariable intensity, they're all the same, as sent from a rice transmitter, and the lower line representing waves of variable intensity as sent by my instrument. There are two important points to be made here. First, Edison was using the format of the telegraph record, a row of dots and dashes to illustrate telephone signals already at this point, and not using the wavy line format of the phonograph. Second, it seems he didn't realize that the kind of signal he was trying to visualize had any meaningful shape to it, since his dots and dashes format could only show the crests and troughs in the signal, not what went on in between them. The significance of the waveform, the wave shape, was the most basic point. Anyone familiar with the phonograph as a speech recording instrument should have known, and Edison evidently didn't know it. In April 1877, Charles Crow deposited his sealed packet with the French Academy of Sciences. Again, no way Edison could have known about that. But also in April of 1877, a news item circulated in the American press about an inventor named James Davis, who claimed to have invented a speaking telephone back in the 1860s. Among other things, he claimed, quote, my apparatus was even more perfect than that of Messrs. Gray and Bell in as much as it could write or register the sounds in a distinct language, a thing which they have not yet accomplished. Although, unfortunately, he gives no further details, and none have come up. This claim appeared in the April 15th, 1877 issue of the New York Tribune, which the team at Menlo Park routinely read and cited. And it was reprinted in the May 16th issue of the Journal of the Telegraph. In this case, Edison's associate, Charles Batchelor, even cut and pasted an article printed on the opposite side of the same page from it into one of his scrapbooks. And he was eagerly reading anything about the telephone. So it's likely that the team at Menlo Park encountered the idea of recording telephone signals in the James Davis article. And that idea had definitely come to Edison's attention by May 24th, when he met General Benjamin Butler at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York. That meeting was the basis for the anecdote related here. It is said that the phonograph was suggested to Edison by a remark of General Butler, who, examining a telephone, said to the inventor, now you must make something to record these sounds. Back in March, Edison had claimed that speech vibrations consisted of these simple pulses of constant frequency but varying intensity. However, about the time of his meeting with Butler, he'd started considering some alternative possibilities, apparently because he was frustrated that his telephones weren't working as well as he'd hoped and he wanted to understand why. That same book Edison had consulted way back at the beginning of all this, The Wonders of Electricity, had summarized a theory put forward by Hermann Helmholtz that, quote, each simple vowel is formed by one or more notes of the scale accompanied by other and feebler notes, which are harmonics of these. And it stated further, Monsieur Helmholtz thinks it would be possible to construct a human voice by artificially producing and combining the elementary sounds of which it is composed. So Edison had begun playing around with the idea that speech sounds might be made up of combinations of frequencies rather than pulses at a single frequency as he'd thought before. We see that new idea at work in a laboratory note dated May 26, 1877, reflecting Edison's conversation with Butler a couple days before. The plan was this. As different speech sounds were transmitted through the telephone, combinations of resonators corresponding to all the different frequencies in them would enter into sympathetic vibration, controlling a typewriter, if they could get that to work, or maybe a set of 25 points pressed against a strip of uh, specially treated recording paper. Now, in technical terms, what Edison and Butler are suggesting is a sound spectrograph for speech analysis, something that wasn't to be developed successfully into the 1940s. But at the same time, what's totally missing here is any notion of recording individual speech vibrations, either as a wavy line or as a row of dots. Now, I submit, if Edison had already known about the phonograph at this point, shouldn't that have suggested a simpler approach to the question of recording telephone messages? In another note, 
dated May 26, 1877, same day, Edison proposed to build a keyboard telephone where pressing a key corresponding to a letter of the alphabet, he didn't distinguish between letters and speech sounds, but that's basically what he meant, would set in motion a combination of single frequency electrical brake wheels, basically synthesizing individual tones so that he could create a sound with all of the correct harmonics in it. So here we have two proposed inventions, one for recording speech over the telephone, one for producing speech, synthetic speech over a telephone, both based on a principle entirely different from that of Scott's phonograph and much more complicated. But Edison soon, soon reverted to his earlier understanding of speech vibrations as sequences of simple pulses. One contributing factor here may have been an experience later cited to explain how he'd invented his phonograph. In mid-1877, he was working on an instrument to record the dots and dashes of incoming telegraph messages as indentations embossed on paper, and then later to reproduce the signal over a wire from the indented record. As far as I've seen, the story was first told by Ezra Jalilland at the Electrical Club in New York City in May 1888 as follows. As a source of amusement and to test the rate of speed at which a Morse operator could receive or read, the reproducing machine was caused to run at a high velocity, and when the speed was increased to such an extent that the ear could not recognize the Morse characters, Mr. Edison noticed that the machine gave off a humming and musical sound, which varied according to the characters in the record, apparently talking in a language which could not be understood. What lesson could Edison have taken away from this? Probably this, that a record consisting of nothing but simple indentations, dots and dashes, could be used to produce speech-like sounds. On July 11th, Edison sketched out a second model of keyboard telephone. This time, instead of setting a combination of separate brake wheels in motion before, so synthesizing a bunch of different tones to make up a sound, each key would now operate a separate wheel of its own, equipped with teeth of varying numbers and heights corresponding to simple pulses of varying intensity. It's just like a little phonograph record, except it's not recorded yet. Meanwhile, Edison's associate, Edward Johnson, had been going around the country giving presentations about the work going on at Menlo Park, and he had asked Edison to send him word of any exciting new developments so he could play them up. Unfortunately, Johnson's personal papers have never been found. So we have his letters to Edison, but not Edison's letters to him, which would also be very interesting. On July 17th, to give one example, Johnson replied to a lost letter in which Edison had apparently promised to send him something on July 12th. He asks about it, so we know the date, and which must therefore have been written on or before that day. He, he writes, now, as to the latest idea of mechanically speaking the letters of the alphabet, Professor B, this is George Barker of the University of Pennsylvania who teamed up with Johnson as a lecturer, is delighted and says it looks as if you might reach by a shortcut the end sought by scientists for ages, namely the ascertainment first of what constitutes a vocal sound of a letter and two, how to mechanically reproduce it. This response hinted that Edison's keyboard telephone idea might have been a bigger deal than he'd thought at first. But one nagging question remained. How to figure out what patterns of teeth to put on each wheel? Nothing we've yet read spells out any means of doing this. And there's some evidence that Edison hadn't yet figured that part out. According to an article published in Strand Magazine in 1905, Simply as a matter of inspiration, the idea of a talking machine occurred to Mr. Edison, and remembering his experiences with the automatic telegraph transmitter, he concluded that if the undulations on the strip could be given the proper form and arrangement, a diaphragm could be vibrated so as to reproduce any desired sounds. The next step was to form the proper undulations on the strip, and the idea was then suggested to Mr. Edison's mind that these undulations could be produced by sounds themselves, which could then be reproduced. It is therefore rather an interesting fact that in the development of the phonograph, the reproduction of the sounds preceded the original production of the record. Based on an interview with Edison, probably based on something he said, but how? was this final idea suggested to Edison's mind that a record could be produced by sounds themselves? Well, in February of 1878, Edison told a New York Sun reporter, quote, 
I was singing to the mouthpiece of a telephone when the vibrations of the voice sent the fine steel point into my finger. That set me to thinking. The pricked finger story came up again and again in the years that followed as the breakthrough moment and is generally said to have been followed immediately by an actual experiment in which Edison tried embossing speech on paraffined paper. His note of the experiment appears at the bottom of a page of notes dated July 18, 1877. Just tried experiment with a diaphragm, having an embossing point and held against paraffin paper, moving rapidly. The speaking vibrations are indented nicely. At this point, though, bear in mind, Edison still seems to have been thinking in terms of his keyboard telephone, looking for patterns he could copy onto its wheels. Another page of notes dated July 18th, 1877, same day, contains what looks like a magnified drawing of an embossed record of a vowel sound. It's certainly not Morse code, and it doesn't have any clear connection with the other notes on the same page. Moreover, Edison gave an interview in April of 1878 in which he describes trying at first to study what records of sound looked like. How long ago did you get the idea of a phonograph, a reporter asked. Only last July, Edison replied. It is a mechanical invention begotten out of an attempt to emboss an alphabet for telegraphy. I found that repeating the letter A many times produced an ever varying puncture, all of unlike depth or size under the microscope. Then it was plain that the voice was its own recorder and measurer. The phonographic alphabet was impossible, but articulation was easy. So when Edison tried to study records produced by the voice under the microscope, he couldn't find any consistent patterns in them. The phonographic alphabet he'd wanted for his keyboard telephone, impossible. But he realized now that he didn't need to identify patterns. He could simply play back the records themselves. In 1888, his associate George Guro stated during a lecture, quote, Edison thought of this thing suddenly, to use his own words to me shortly after his great discovery. It suddenly occurred to me, if that thing would do what I was trying to make it do, that if I spoke to it, it ought to speak back. Hence, the second part of Edison's account of the experiment. There's no doubt that I shall be able to store up and reproduce automatically at any future time the human voice perfectly. Now, it's true that another page of notes exists dated July 17th, 1877, in which Edison proposes a few scenarios based on the principle of recording speech and then playing it back. Now that might seem to imply that he already had this idea before he carried out his first recording experiment on July 18th. You can't discover something on July 18th and talk about it on July 17th. But if we read court depositions about how and when Edison and his associates signed and dated their laboratory notes, we learn that this routinely happened a little while after the fact, not long enough to make a difference in, say, a, a priority of invention lawsuit, but long enough to introduce some uncertainty about exact dates, particularly when work often continued across the midnight hour. My hypothesis is that the note dated July 17th, which seems to start in mid-sentence anyway, is actually a continuation of the experimental record dated July 18th, with Edison speculating about uses for the principle he just discovered. There's no doubt that I shall be able to store up and reproduce automatically at any future time the human voice perfectly reproduced, slow or fast, by a copyist and written down. This can be applied telegraphically thus, and then, he draws a phonographic device put in connection with a telephone line. He goes on then to suggest playing rapid speech back at a quarter of its original speed so that unskilled workers could transcribe it and that other methods of recording might work, such as poking holes in the paper, since as far as he was concerned, the signal consisted of nothing but these simple pulses of varying strength. Now, if there were any doubt about these developments actually having taken place in July of 1877, maybe these records were backdated or something like that, they're dispelled by a provisional telephone patent specification filed in London on July 30th, as officially received that day in London. Some portions of my improvement, it states, can be availed of to make a record of the atmospheric sound waves or of the electric waves or pulsations corresponding thereto or resulting therefrom also contains an account of Edison's keyboard telephone idea. 
The word phonograph first turns up in a laboratory note dated August 12th, followed by a draft press release about the Edison phonograph dated September 7th. Now, those dates show that Edison can't possibly have picked the word up from the first published article about Shaw Crow's idea, which didn't appear until October 10th. In fact, though, many people seem independently to have coined the terms phonograph, phonographic, phonography, and so forth to describe efforts to write sound all the way back into the early 18th century. During September, Edison's notes show him toying with a variety of recording methods. He's really trying to brainstorm here. How, what are all the possible ways you can get a sound down on paper? Or down on anything? A pen pressing down, more or less firmly. Em embossing the edge of a strip of paper. Displacing a piece of thread and then pressing it down permanently into place. What's conspicuously missing here and everywhere else in Edison's notes for this period is anything even vaguely resembling the phonautographic method of tracing a wavy line on paper. Now, the further development of this idea into the first tinfoil phonograph and beyond was, was really only a matter of implementation. The full idea is, is there at this point. Edison's finished his path to the phonograph. Now he's walking down the path of phonographic development into a commercial venture. But one thing to bear in mind, since Edison bore it in mind, viewed from above, tinfoil phonograph records still looked like dots and dashes. Here's a sample excerpt of a record published in the Scientific American that December. Edison's first United States phonograph patent wasn't actually his first true phonograph patent, as is often claimed. Um, uh, Stefan Puy has identified an earlier and somewhat more primitive Canadian patent. But in this first United States phonograph patent, filed on Christmas Eve, 1877, Edison states, I have discovered, after a long series of experiments, that a diaphragm or other body capable of being set in motion by the human voice does not give, except in rare instances, superimposed vibrations, as has heretofore been supposed, but that each vibration is separate and distinct, and therefore it becomes possible to record and reproduce the sounds of the human voice. In other words, he wrongly thought that his phonograph had disproven Helmholtz's theory that it wouldn't have worked if Helmholtz's theory had been correct. And by looking at it from above, it did look like dots, separate discrete dots. Other people working in the field picked up on this. In early 1878, Thomas Watson of Telephone fame is reported to have said that if this is true, all the preconceived ideas of sound must be greatly modified. In fact, Edison's phonograph only worked because those indentations actually did contain all that detail about what was happening between the wave crests. It was just hard to see them. But if Edison had been familiar with the phonograph, he should have known that. So I've outlined what I see as Edison's path to the phonograph. I, I expect there may be some fighting words in there. Um, hopefully, we can be civil about this. I know there's a, there's a tendency in some of these uh, debates to uh, take, take sides very uh, passionately. You know, are you an Edison guy or are you a Tesla guy? <laughs> Answer right or you're going to lose some teeth. Yeah, so. What I just want to suggest here, though, is that I, I don't see any step along this path that could conceivably represent the influence of Scott's work. But don't go away from this thinking that Edison's phonograph was not indebted to Scott's phonautograph. What was the first invention that Edison started trying to work with? The Rice Telephone. What had inspired the Rice Telephone? The Scott phonautograph. So, even if Edison didn't know it, he was ultimately indebted to Scott's work, as are we all. Thank you.